Okay. I would hope that an introduction of Ron Heron, a member of Archigram, would not be. Is this going to go or not? Our mic system has really gone to pot, I think, around here. But I would, as I said, I would hope that an introduction of Ron Heron of Archigram would really not be necessary uh, to this group this morning. I think Ron and the group have been well covered in most of the updated history books. Uh, their work, I think, you know, is, is very well known. Uh, they were masters of communication. I would, in, in their heyday, I would hope that that communication has gotten through to most of our students here. Uh, however, in this world of change, and changing superstars, and turnover, et cetera, I think a, a, an attitude I think that maybe Ron would be a proponent of the change. Uh, quite often those of a couple of years ago who were very much in the front are sometimes not there uh, any longer. Uh, Ron Heron and the Archigram group were well known for the key words such as plug-in, snap-on, walking cities, et cetera, et cetera, that all denoted a change in the attitudes in the 60s from permanent kinds of structures to impermanent structures and change. Uh, this at that time really hit the architectural world, you know, with a great bang. And things like Zoom, and, you know, all, the, all these were, were the, the things that were unsettling the establishment in the 60s. They were really, I would say, if I can say so, the Beatles of architecture, I don't know if Brian, you like that term, I would assume you would, but I, I would say they were, they were that kind of uh, uh, firm and that kind of thinkers and those kind of, that kind of operation. Uh, The only thing that I always felt is unfortunate is that those who lead and those who quite often write and those who draw and those who communicate sometimes don't get a chance to do the work. Aren't you hearing me without this? Yeah. Don't, don't, don't get a chance to do the work that uh, they, are, they are projected. And most of the, the archigram type of, of architecture that we did get to see uh, came out of the Japanese o Osaka. I, I really would rather not have this. <laughs> oh, okay. <laughs> Shelley says it's not taping, but I don't think that's too damn important when, when we're at this point. But anyway, I. What, what did happen, however, that in Osaka Expo, uh, much of the, ar the ideas of Archigram uh, were, were brought forward. And the Japanese have always been probably able to get up the work so much more quickly than uh, the rest of us around the world. And so quite often, the ideas that are prevalent are, are usually constructed there. Uh, along with that, however, is that the Uh, almost yearly now, 
and uh, hasn't spoken to us, I think, for a couple of years. So without dragging this on any longer, I'd like to give the morning to Ron here. We want to get you on I don't, can I ask a question? Were many of you at my other two lectures? Yes. Too many? No. no. <laughs> I've got the same slides. Um, okay. I called the other two lectures connect, um, collisions. I don't know, you may remember that. Now this, uh, the one at UCLA I called collisions in the sense that um, I'm a sort of, like most architects, uh, a Jekyll and Hyde character. Most of the work I'm going to show is unbuilt, um, is on drawing paper. The sort of uh, area of work that most architects proliferate, um, ideas, conversations with yourself and with your friends. So the collision is this business of being uh, a practicing architect, in quotes, and an unpracticing architect, in quotes. And the, the problem of trying to bring these two things together. Um, some people over the years managed to do this. I, I haven't yet, very often. So I find that mostly I'm talking about ideas. Um, the other sort of collision I talked about at USC was the collision in the Rowe sense, in that he talks about the city as a collision of parts, um, of, of incompleteness, of, of that being something that we should enjoy rather than worry about. Most architects and most planners look for completeness. They look for a final product. Uh, Rowe talks about collision. I like that as an idea. Um, now, I'm not going to talk about collisions at all today. I'm just going to address myself to the stuff on the wall. And I'd like to, if the people that have heard these before, quote a few people, um, if they could just bear with me. There's a smashing quote. It's got nothing to do with architecture, apparently. It's from Albert Camus, The Fall. He says, I am a well aware that an addiction to silk underwear does not necessarily imply that one's feet are dirty. Nonetheless, style, like sheer silk, too often hides eczema. Now that's a very profound statement in an architectural sense. Um, so often, things get built that appear to have an intellectual base, appear to take into account all those things that we talk about, context and so on. And yet they hide, uh, hide unprofessionalism, they hide uh, a lack of ideas and so on. So I think that's a key point. Another thing um, that occurred to me was that in the sense, um, this city, more than any other city I can think of, um, is a city of collisions. Uh, everything's colliding. I, I was on a AIA Awards uh, jury uh, for Southern California about two or three weeks ago. Um, and it was very disappointing. Uh, I found that the collisions that were occurring in the work that was shown uh, were such that they had uh, added nothing to this environment, th this city, um, this city of collisions, um, in the sense that they tended to draw from an international style. Th there was a sort of endless parade of mirror glass and, and those sorts of buildings that always worry me, I guess this is very personal, those international style boxes that come out of the Weisenhof uh, and the Twenters with their timber cladding 
and their creosote. I really have trouble with things like that. But I shouldn't, of course. Um, this is my own ingrained predilection. OK, one other quote, and then I'll show the slides. Schweitzer. I too once had thoughts of being inter an intellectual, but I found it too difficult. OK, can we have the slide? <laughs> Do we have to have all the light? No. Someone's taking it. Wait, can I? Yes. Um, some golden oldies to start with. Um, the Archigram group of the 60s um, were primarily concerned with making noise. We used to always talk about putting noise into the system. It was to do with trying to make people think, other architects think, about architecture in different ways, to look at things in different ways, not to get into that sort of tightrope of, of architecture um, of that sort of international style. Um, we were producing a magazine called Archigram. Uh, this is number four, about 1964, um, whose, the object of which was to shock and annoy um, and to make people sit up. It, it was at the point where the offset litho process of printing was easily available. It, it meant that any idiot could put a magazine together with very little money and print it. I mean, it, a lot of effort. I mean, this thing, particular cover, um, was uh, screen printed on, on the kitchen table at Dennis Crompton's. And all the, um, I forget, 10,000 issues hung on clotheslines all around his apartment. It took little problems like that, but it was to do with, with shock. We used to use the term again all the time. Uh, you, you'd get some discussion about what went into the magazine, and the, 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 one of the prime determinants was uh, if you could say, that'll annoy them. Um, so it, it was geared that way. The scheme on the left is one of mine, which was very much to do with that. It's over the years been attacked um, by, by Dutch, such diverse people as the international socialists, um, a, a, as being a scheme predicting war machines, and by uh, Doxiadis um, as being something that shouldn't be allowed. Um, so, in that sense, it was successful. They, they are the very sorts of people that one was aiming the, the comment at. It was to do with a city that moved. Um, that, that's just one of the drawings. There's a series, it puts it in New York, in the sea, and so on. It was, in a way, a comment on Peter Cook's plug-in city, which was to do with uh, change and so on, but in a very static way. Um, and so I was actually commenting on my mate's drawings. Um, I still like machines. I must own up to this in this day of anti-technology and awful books like high tech. Um, I like machines and I collect things like this Reaper um, and, and like this amazing wall climbing machine on the left. Again, one doesn't know when one puts these into file, quite what it means. I mean, God knows what you would do with such a machine. Um, but, 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 I mean, I just enjoy, um, you know, the, the, the sort of way this piece of machinery goes together. And it seems to give a clue to what architecture might be. Other projects of a bit later to do with putting things into the existing city. We use words. Words were always important. This title, the tuned suburb, this tuning uh, of the existing environment was always key 
to, to what we were doing. This was um, Instant City uh, at that period where one was talking about the kit of parts, um, the, the components that went together to make um, some other larger uh, piece of city. This, this was to travel around. It was like a circus. It hit the town. It brought the metropolis to the town. It was always geared to information um, and to music and sound and so on. Um, I guess that the, the history of this sort of thing is long. Um, it, it goes back to uh, military things, um, but I, I still again find a fascination um, with those elements of the city that are not permanent, um, that, that come and go. Uh, comments again, I, uh, the magazine was always commenting on things. This was, these two drawings, were put, uh, amongst some others, were put together. They, they had a title called It's a um, which was asking a question. I'd read somewhere, um, I think it was in the RIBA journal, um, this is the, like the AIA journal, um, a comment by one of our younger eminent architects um, bemoaning the fact that in this uh, era no one had developed a style for public buildings. Um, this amused me, no end. Um, to me, Architecture uh, is about containing use in an appropriate way. And, and so I took a beach and uh, attached things to the beach and then asked the questions of whether it's actually a beach or whether it's housing, whether it's a school. Um, depending on what you do with space, um, that space becomes that. This room could equally be a banqueting room, a dining room, a sitting room, a school, a business center. Um, there's no real magic to that. Um, it's activity that makes architecture. Uh, more things along those lines. This was a project in Monte Carlo that was to do with uh, making an outdoor space. Um, this is um, for Prince Rainier. Um, was to do with the gambling hall at Monte Carlo, but the thing that interests me with this one single space, it's some, I don't know, 200, 300 feet long, um, 100 feet wide, which was to be a gala space so that the Grace Kelly could uh, organize uh, Red Cross balls and uh, Save the Children funds and all that. Um, and they asked that the space be uh, outdoor, and they asked that there be a retractable enclosure. They asked that it would be well serviced. And the thing that I added was um, a set design. Um, we made very simple space and then proposed that the interiors could be handled um, by stage set designers so that you could reconstruct um, any, any uh, place within this place out of tiki tacky and paper. Um, it's interesting, again, I guess this is where I diverge from people like Moore and Geary. Um, they are in a, a, the, the real architectural tradition of reality. Um, I enjoy this sort of dream world uh, of theater. So, I then um, looked at an English suburb. This is my, actually the, the suburb I live in, uh, just outside London. It's very proper. Um, it, it has elements uh, out of architecture that give properness, an image, uh, a clue to, to it being an okay place to live. It it's houses um, people like bank managers and insurance executives, um, the young businessman. And they choose the, the sort of architecture. Um, th this is fairly old. It's about 1920. But they choose the architecture because it 
depicts to others how they wish to be seen. It's the public face that they choose. Um, it, it relates to Elizabethan England and funny magazines we have like the Tatler um, and well you can imagine sort of sort of society magazine on the cheap um, you always get strange people that uh, don't quite want to fit in um, but uh, it's it's a suggestion of being different rather than being different and what fascinated me always was that in fact if you read the local paper and you talk to people there are some very, very interesting people behind the facades. Um, they're not stereotyped, in fact. Um, I use this very frequently um, uh, uh, as a, a comment on building in those sorts of places. Um, the suburb includes uh, insertions like this. Um, the one on the well, let's start with this one. This one on the left is um, meeting the architectural requirements of the planners in the area. We have very, very hot and uh, very rigid uh, controls of how things should look. And this guy was asked to use slate and brick because the guy next door had used slate and brick and so on and so on. And he's put it together uh, in such a way. Um, now, you might like or dislike that. I mean, I think it's appalling. Um, it, it's absolutely ham-handed. And it's got a board up here. The, this board is one that the our RIBA issue. So this guy is a fully paid up member of the architectural profession. Um, he's a, as it were, a colleague of mine. Um, one that... Uh, should be drummed out of the profession. This guy is not an architect. He's got much more imagination. He bought a very standard house. He's applied plastic brick in a very decorative way, very inventive little insertions into this. Beautiful entrance and so on. He has established a whole style. This street is now full of people <laughs> sticking this stuff on. <laughs> Nobody takes any notice of that guy at all. So there's something to learn there, the sort of inherent designer in people. Um, it does no harm. Uh, that does a lot of harm. So I decided that I would look at the suburbs, and I designed these three, there are three houses here. Um, I did this project, I should add, with my son. Um, we took uh, three families and we said that this guy is an architect, this guy is a, a camping freak, and this guy is an ex-Air Force uh, pilot. We then said, okay, this is the public face. <laughs> this is where choices are made by the community or by the planner. The, the public area, the public domain. And then beyond that, the private person can operate at will. On the left, the context, the airspace that each plot is allowed. Um, you can use the uh, screen walls to set up imagery so that you can uh, photographically depict anywhere so you can be anywhere. This is the camper. It's upside down, but if you could just bear in mind, this is public area, public face, private area, and then the games that go on beyond that. Uh, the camper um, is, is fairly geared up. He, this is my, again, my own predilection start to feed in. I mean, there are tension structures. There's a garden at first floor level that's on a track so he can move it up and down and he can move the trailers around on the site and then this boundary screen is the pictorial uh, view that he's chosen that's the sort of camper or this he likes the good life he, he's not uh, in the Baden-Powell tradition 
This is the, the garden. Um, on the left, uh, a drawing my son did of, um, uh, of the reverse. Uh, it, it, he took uh, a Miesian uh, inspired facade, a square grid, mirror glass even, um, and had a, a guy actually camping behind. Um, this is the architect. Um, he has all the paraphernalia that you'd expect in an architectural setting. The very carefully placed um, courtyards, the grid, one meter grid over the site, um, bathroom capsules, staircases that are spirals, movable screens. So he's recognizable. He's very cleverly put his garden on the roof so that he utilizes the site to its utmost. It could be like that, of course. He might be that sort of architect or that sort of architect. This is a slight break, but, but in, in the course of doing this, I was asked to design some bathroom sets. Um, and I had great fun. Uh, this uh, is, is a landscape bathroom set, and this is a high-tech, if you like, um, bathroom set. I mean, the object of the exercise, unfortunately, was to sell the bath. Um, they were just for magazine covers. The bomber pilot um, bought a Liberator uh, and moved his family in. And he rigged up um, laser guns in, in the turrets. And he could shoot at the wars and so live vicariously his Second World War experiences. It then occurred to me that, like with all these projects, if you're working in this sort of vacuum, you're just drawing um, from ideas, you, you can go on and on and on. You can keep layering these things. And this is the point where I stop. It occurred to me that in the window of that private uh, world, um, on the public face side, you could insert optional windows. And the idea being that people walking by would think that you live like that, behind that very ordinary um, facade. And you could choose the picture, and you could backlight it and drop blinds. So you could do a real double take. I mean, you could go on then. I mean, I had another series of drawings where um, there was a window like this with this picture, but there was another window in the picture that appeared to be further back, so people could get all sorts of layered and they'd go away very confused about what your lifestyle <laughs> was about. I then set about the Queen. Um, there was this uh, Japanese ex uh, competition called the House for a Superstar. Um, you had to choose a superstar. This, this was in that line of competitions that Moore and Sterling and Peter Cook judge. This was the one that Izasaki was um, adjudicating. Um, and you had to choose a superstar and then make a house. Quite simple. I chose the queen because I think there's no better actress in the world. Her whole life has been geared to being able to smile uh, at children and tap people's shoulders and call them a night. She gives uh, a public persona that says she drinks tea, but we all know she likes champagne as well. She loves dogs, and if you're an English actress stroke queen, you have to like dogs. And she has a son who is in the tradition. He's been trained um, to, to the utmost um, in the acting profession, and he can smile at will and he does all those things like join the Navy that all our king, uh, future kings do. She has a daughter that's opted out. She's rude, can't act, dislikes people, prefers horses. <laughs> Which again is in the tradition of the British royal family. But the environment that they live in is of course of this nature. 
uh, of adulation. Uh, this is New York. This would never happen in London, by the way. You'd never be allowed to throw paper. Um, <laughs> Uh, so she lives in that sort of environment. Um, or this sort of environment, this is Trafalgar Square in London, being where a, a public set has been erected to, uh, so the crowds can sit down and so on and watch the state opening of Parliament as their coaches pass through Admiralty Arch and so on. So everything's dressed up. There's a whole tradition um, for centuries uh, in, in the big cities of, of, of events and dressings and staging things. So that was the context. And this is the, the proposal for the Queen. This is a palace uh, on the west coast of Scotland that I call Sets Fit for the Queen. It's very architectural. It, it's some three quarters of a mile long and three, uh, half a mile wide, highly serviced, uh, there's a whole underground network of, of, of people and little guys, like, like Disneyland, that pop up and sweep the floor and all that. <laughs> um, in, and it's on a square grid, um, a very regular uh, square grid, um, what do you call it, tartan grid. Um, it, in fact, is based on Burbank Studios. And the idea was that the the this huge shed could be structured continually at whim. You, you could uh, make settings in very uh, film-like, um, stage-like way to meet occasions. And so that the frontispiece, uh, as you drive up to the uh, entrance, you drive along a long, mile-long uh, carriageway with, with, with trees either side, so it's very geared to perspective, the, the whole thing's heightened. Um, and then there's a facade that's out of Palladio here, um, with giant steps uh, and a pediment and so on. And then a, a Renaissance uh, wall. And then that uh, line is the public face. This is where the public uh, can view, can see what is going on. And then there are a series of layers back through the palace. This is the ceremonial set. I, I call each area a set, like the public set and private set. This is ceremonial, this is official, this is family, and then this is the private set of the individual. And so the, the interiors can be modeled. There, there's reception sets and music room sets and terrace sets and ballroom set and royal set. And in this area, there's an investiture set, and a banqueting set, and a diplomatic set. And as you go through, the private spaces become very individual. There's a quarter deck set for Philip, and there's a Barbarella set for the Queen. <coughs> the analogy, this is uh, universal. Um, that half the Queen sees, you see. This half is the working situation. Um, the other sheet that went with that, that described the situation, described the use, described all the things I've just said. Um, again, um, universal. Uh, you could even organize it this way. You could have trams um, with a guide giving you the lowdown on, on what's going on. Uh, then I took some of the rooms. This is the dining set. Um, you can see it's uh, unreal, it, it's a stage set, it's propped up um, and, and it's made of tiki-taki and, and so on. I gave some options, you could, I chose some out of Domus magazine, some out of the Tatler, some out of the Habitat catalogue and some out of the Herman Miller catalogue to describe how the dining room could be, the choices. Um, but I then honed in on this one and describe in this specification. This is a, as it were, a production drawing. Um, and there's a specification here that's to do with getting the character of that room right. It's to do with spraying dust on everything and to sandpapering the, all the materials down so they're threadbare and to making sure there are cobwebs in the corner and to insert that smell you get 
in those terrible old palaces in England of mustiness and dry rot. And so I've described for the builder's attention how he is to obtain that here, um, to arrive at a room such as this that would depict uh, a royal palace. Um, I should add that the room is actually the dining room at Buckingham Palace. It's a slight double take there. I made then some elevations. This um, doesn't work very well in this situation. It's a very long drawing, some 26 feet long, uh, of the... This is a smashing drawing. I never finish because if you think about it, if you take the people off, you can print it ten times and make the mile long dry. Very lax way of, of making a, a statement. I love repeats. It, it saves all that drawing. So it, it, potentially it's 40 feet long, if you could just imagine that going on. And then I'm, I put the uh, palace together. Um, and really you have to look very closely because um, you begin to see edges that are, are unreal and you start to see that the, the wall of, of the castle is actually paper thin and it's propped up by scaffolding and that there are set pieces going on behind the facade. So it starts to give clues. Because in the end, you, you, as a designer, you want people to know that you've thought about it that way, you see. Um, and I think that's the difference um, with the sort of things I was talking about earlier, the, the, the sort of Californian aesthetic of collision uh, is where you have to dig to find out that it's like that. It's hidden. Um, I, in my Puritan way, like people to realize that I know what I'm doing. Um, I then made this drawing, which is to do with wiring them for sound um, so that casual conversation can be picked up. And it's to do with the sort of match Im image of Sonny and Cher and Philip and Elizabeth and the showbiz. Uh, we then, uh, Dennis Crompton and I, uh, were asked by Rod Stewart to design a swimming pool for him. He bought this um, uh, house from the Marcus of Queensbury. Um, I think that the only point here I'd like to make is that it, 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 was an ex it sounded like one of those dream jobs. It wasn't. It was a pain in the ass. It, it, it had one interesting point, was that th this is the swimming pool, that the building is protected. And again, in England, our planning laws demand that you meet very stringent requirements or, um, uh, to bring the addition in line with the quality of the original building. Um, which was very funny. We had to make a submission to the ministry and we made drawings of this. All these bits are out of catalogues and in fact it's just painted brickwork. And we submitted it and got approval. And it was done very casually, but we were credited uh, and we had a lovely letter from the minister um, congratulating us on our sensitivity, our attention to detail and our apparent awareness of Georgian architecture, which was sheer nonsense. Um, and it just shows you what you can get away with if you play theatre, if, if, if you play it out in a very Hollywood way. The, just a couple of slides again. That's how I imagined it. Um, I've been reading too many fan magazines. That's how it turned out. <laughs> He was much better, you see. He took the existing interior of the, uh, the main building and, uh, and did this to it, um, which was much more in tune to the place. It, it matched his style of the silk suit and all that. Um, and he keeps it in that condition. He has a brother who's a painter and decorator. And the brother continuously paints the house, like the fourth bridge. He's painting it backwards and forwards. <laughs> then uh, we were asked um, to design a set for a real king. A real king. Um, the king of Saudi Arabia. 
now this is not an Arabian night story, but uh, we uh, did an exhibition in London um, in 76, 77, which used a very large tension structure on a mast. Um, I won't bore you with that, but um, which it, it was quite a nice structure. It was designed with um, Happold, Ted Happold, who's an engineer, um, with sort of containery uh, cables and, and uh, with the uh, tent structure, then tension between uh, the mast <coughs> and the edge. Um, Parsons of Pasadena were, um, are, designing a new town just north of uh, Jeddah on the Red Sea coast for the Saudi Arabians. It's an oil town and they uh, have marked the site out, it's some 20 miles by 8 miles long, in the desert by the sea and they built a, a temporary harbour and a uh, wa water treatment plant that they floated these things in from Japan. So out in the desert you get nothing and these two things moored with a fence that's whatever it is, 50 miles long, um, chain link. Uh -huh. um, I was at the Gary lecture, you see, um, uh, around the site. Um, and then we were asked to design for this place the opening ceremony. Um, th they were going to bring the king along to cut a a thing or press a button to say uh, I now inaugurate this town. It doesn't exist, I mean it, it will exist. And the Saudi Arabians bought this tent after the exhibition second hand um, and then asked us to design the ceremony. So that's the beginning of, of that. Um, there were quite interesting problems of then trying to reuse, recycle a thing of such size, the problems of trying to uh, capture the um, culture of Saudi Arabia. I kept drawing Rudolf Valentino over and over again. <laughs> um, of of, of uh, inserting into this all the hardware of, of exhibition and opening ceremony and so on. Um, Eames chairs cropped up over and over again. The, the king, we were told, was a very modern man and insisted that, uh, that, that they were a part of the modern world. So it was very important um, that we use these sort of elements that are all shipped in because there, there's actually nothing like that made there. There's no, uh, there's no, ev there's no um, architecture traditional to the area either. Um, and so on, this was the uh, audio visual room. That, that's the tent proper. Um, the, of course, the other interesting thing, they then I had to go to Jeddah to make this uh, presentation to the Royal Commission. There was a young sheikh, a uh, Stanford graduate, you'd be pleased to know, of 23 or 24 years old, <coughs> who was um, responsible for this billion, billion dollar city. Um, so he uh, uh, organized his Learjet to fly me around the site um, and the pilot sort of did all sorts of loops around it so I could see. And then there was a limousine. We landed on a black strip in the desert and there was a limousine. I don't know where it came from. It was standing there. <laughs> and we were driven round this fence and I was asked, believe it or not, to decide where this ceremony should take place. It, it's again that, that student situation of the greenfield site, the ultimate greenfield site, where you were given half the desert of Saudi Arabia and told to put a tent down in a significant place. <laughs> <laughs> and because what you discover, like you will in architecture generally, all people want is for you to decide. And so I said, there. And they said, great. <laughs> and so on. The King's Suite and the setting. Uh, unfortunately, we never got to do it. Um, the Sheikh got nervous and decided that uh, 
because it was an opening ceremony, a royal occasion, that a Saudi architect should design the ceremony um, and not an amalgam of Americans and English. Uh, um, I understood that. I mean, politically, he was right. Um, the annoying thing is that we understand on the grapevine they actually did exactly what we'd uh, said. But that happens. That's life. Um, a recent project, this is in Stavanger in Norway, very boring program, uh, a medieval town, real, not, not Universal Studio backlot, but real stuff, um, little houses, like so, timber, uh, white painted, bordered timber houses, generally speaking, uh, um, a lot of snow around, um, generally speaking, rather grey, miserable place. Um, the, the, they, they have this sort of half a year where it's dark all day and half a year where it's light day and night. Huh? So it's a very strange environment, um, but very, very pretty place. And they, the authorities, um, this is an existing cinema here, it's a little square. There's a port over here and a castle <coughs> here and the commercial <coughs> centers up there. And the authorities decided they needed a library um, for the town, and they needed more cinemas and conference facilities. So we were asked to put on this site some enormous area of, of building. I mean, really enormous, a quarter of a million square feet or something like that. You can't go below the ground because like most central areas of Norwegian cities, they've built car parks under these areas. They tunnel in and, and make car park near us, so you, it's all pedestrianized so that when you come to build here, you're stuck with A level, which is uh, floor level. More contextual things. That's the existing uh, cinema on the left. Um, and the problem was obvious once you start playing with it, of, of trying to put, like forever, people are trying to put too much uh, on a given site, and then asking you, as if you're a magician, right, a quarter million square feet, to be sympathetic to these little medieval one-family houses. It's like the Pacific Design Center and the little bungalows, huh? exactly the same. So, like an idiot, you go through the whole process and you fall over backwards to break the edge, um, pick up roots, um, covered roots, a very miserable climate, so you're always trying to be inside. Um, the library was uh, located here, and then I made a series of cinemas along this side, opening off the route. Um, there's nothing very significant about the project, but I'll get to the point. In a so you can see it bulks up as, as some really huge piece of building. Um, I spent hours trying to cut the edge and, and knit it in such a way that it didn't destroy. Um, bulk again. This is the route that became a four or five story um, arcade at a number of levels. Traditional solution. Uh, more studies of edges. Uh, a model. And you can see it bulks up very big to these tiny little houses. I can't do anything about that. It's a terrible slide. Um, trying to uh, knit entrances and the new building and the old building together in such manner. Ah, and then it, I, it, uh, the penny dropped. Um, I'd been doing all this and then it suddenly dawned on me that I was trying to put too big a building on the site. And so I spent a lot of time looking at library systems um, and I submitted my drawings in the end <coughs> Um, I didn't bother to redraw, but I did a, a report then on library systems, um, such as this fast retrieval, um, no public access to stacks, and so on, which uh, would have meant they could reduce the bulk by about a third at least. Um, and my argument then was that you could actually spread uh, this system through the city as well, um, and, and you could actually get back to this sort of scale. 
So, like all these situations, you end up wasting your time because you know nobody's going to take any notice. They actually want to build this big library. And I used as uh, an analogy for here the Boberg Library. I mean, um, the Boberg Library was, uh, the Boberg was mentioned earlier as being archigram uh, or inspired. Um, and people uh, go there and look at very obvious things. Uh, uh, they look at the, um, you know, that gi giant frame. They enjoy the ride. Um, uh, they go and watch exhibitions. But actually, the key thing about that building, that particular building, is the library, which is a most amazing thing. I don't know if any of you have been in there. It's accessible to anybody, including foreigners. Um, they have videotapes, slide programs, and books that you can draw out and use on the premises any day, including Sunday. And you or I, as foreigners, can go in there and do this. You can go and watch a football match, even. Um, you can borrow the tape. It doesn't have to be intellectual and cultural. So I use that as an image. Huh? More studies. But I think the point is uh, that so often um, we go irresponsibly um, into these sort of projects um, that have been set up by bureaucrats um, that want to pump up the importance of the town and not thinking about it. And then they set you this problem um, and where often the answer is in the program. No way, no way can you uh, uh, answer this in an architectural manner. Um, this sort of insertion thing has fascinated me. Um, this, this business of putting uh, the new world with the old. And I, did, I had an exhibition in London a couple of years back. And I made a series of drawings. It, these are um, a collection. I, I use drawings um, like a writer uses a tape recorder. If I have a thought or I, I want to sort of discuss something with myself, I draw it. And a very shorthand, very fast way of just collecting your thoughts and ideas. And this was to do with putting gross sort of modern elements into a very hot historical one and what it means. Um, like uh, here, the Horse Guards Parade in London or St. James's Park. Or the juxtaposition of things, uh, of inserting into this landscape this landscape, um, the sets, uh, are current sets. You know, this is these are both from magazines of the same year. Uh, the mind boggles that, that those two things can exist in this world. Um, and uh, my love for uh, scaffolding, as against mesh, um, and my love for layering as well. Um, the the scaffold. Um, offers a clue, um, not in an art sense, but in a very practical sense, to me, to another sort of architecture. Um, where, uh, for instance, uh, the beauty of that structure and, and this structure overlaid um, on, on a piece of history um, is really something. And the sort of ideas of, of, of thinness and layering that uh, uh, jump into your mind when you look this thing. Because the sad thing is that it all comes down. They build this thing up and then take it all down and it's boring. Um, again, another picture of that. This is the Foster Ipswich building. Uh, do you know Foster? Does that mean anything to you? Yeah. He's one of those hot shot uh, English architects. Mirror glass building. And the, the, there's a leak or something on the roof. Uh, and they put up this scaffold and ladders thing and, and a piece of sheeting. And for me, that's magic. It makes that building something. And it should stay. Unfortunately, they take it down. Um, insertions into landscape, um, the, the uh, ubiquitous insertion um, that, uh, that I enjoy. Um, other insertions, I mean, into Munich. Huh? Uh, this, this city of, of uh, history um, that's depicted here on a cheap postcard. I like the double take of the history on its cheap silver card and the Fry Otto Olympic 
um, buildings on the left. Uh, I don't know if any of you have been there. I think some of you did go there. Huh? Yeah, I mean, marvellous. Huh? I mean, appalling buildings, um, but lovely town. Um, and then my own transformations. I transformed uh, Buckingham Palace into the Movie Land Wax Museum. And uh, one of my local shopkeepers, who uh, is, uh, we have a soccer um, league, and this man is a supporter of, an England, uh, of a London club called Arsenal, um, my local club. Uh, uh, and he decorates this place and uh, celebrates um, Arsenal winning or whatever. And he's a great, he's like the man with the stick on uh, stone. Huh? Uh, he is forever playing with, with his piece of architecture. It's very kinetic, very enjoyable. Um, other insertions, a Korea-like insertion. I, I, do you know Korea? Uh, oh, uh, Geary mentioned Korea. He called him a rat. Uh, I think he was being polite, but... Uh, <laughs> uh, the, you know, the, this business uh, of order and so on, this is uh, in Venice, and the, the beauty of the curtain that flaps in the wind. I mean, the, you know, the, the Ray Abraham and Creer and so on obviously enjoy the curtain thing because they use it all the time. But in history, it's got a long thing. And a local insertion, I love it. Um, the, the, the little um, decorator um, styled porch in the Pacific Design Center to this, I don't know what it is, a restaurant. And I'm sure Pelly must have fits when he thinks about it. But it actually does something, doesn't it? It, it, it? You know, it's transient, you know it's going to come and go. And it's a part of the, what I, can, I, mean, I find so extraordinary about this whole building, um, not the blueness of it and so on, but you go in and all those decorator shops, I've never seen anything like that in my whole life. Um, this sort of ticky-tacky furniture. It's so easy to find when it's put in one place. Uh, more near the end, I guess. Um, a theatre that I've been doing for two years. Um, the clients can never quite get the money together. Um, they're a repertory group. They have a tent. They operate out of a tent at the moment. Um, and they travel the London uh, parks and commons with a, a theatre group. Uh, they play Beckett and sort of Becker's Opera and so on. Like that. A uh, very good stage director uh, sh um, from the Royal Shakespeare. Um, and they want to get rid of their tent, which is small and very difficult to pull up. It's got great arches that are, you know, you always talk about lightweight structures. Uh, um, this tent they have seats 250 people, and it's constructed as two arches that have to be erected. Uh, and these two arches have... Uh, um, circular steel uh, tubes uh, as the arch. They're about, I don't know, something over a foot diameter. They weigh tons. So they have to be hauled up by 10 people on ratchets and gears and so on. And then because they have to lay this lightweight skin over it. Now this lightweight skin weighs five tons, which also has to be hauled up. So we went into this whole process and, and this is, uh, the first proposal was for uh, an inflatable. There's a theatre space and then two small spaces, which is a foyer and green room. And it's structured um, uh, as a series of low-pressure tubes um, that hoop over the site with um, low-pressure cushions that zip in between them uh, as tension members. The, I forget the size, uh, 16 metres. Uh, 60 feet or something like that across, and uh, uh, sorry, I can't do some sort of 90 feet long, something like that, and about uh, nine, me eight meters high, 30 feet high, something like that. It's to seat 400. Well, this give you a better clue. Um, there's a lighting rig um, that we borrowed um, out of um, 
the pop world, I mean, the, the sort of traveling show. There's some ama amazingly beautiful um, uh, rigs that the, these guys have developed over the years, lighting and sound rigs that wind up. Um, because in England, we have to use a substructure inside the inflatable in case the thing collapses. Um, it's a sort of boots and braces, uh, or braces and belt uh, idea. Um, we then ran a, a computer program on it to try and ascertain the conditions inside. We, we had a, a program that took the season uh, one year in London uh, of weather conditions, temperature drops and so on, through day and night. And we could make a prediction on the, the humidity level and so on inside, um, given a certain number of people and given certain weather conditions. And we discovered that uh, we needed a hell of a lot of ventilation, uh, much more than we'd anticipated. So we modified the structure. It's now like a sort of spare rib. There's a, a great uh, tube that runs end to end, um, spans the 90 feet. Um, and then these uh, other ribs lay over it and are tied onto it. So it's very simple um, uh, in construction. These are about eight feet diameter. Um, they're maintained at a constant pressure because once you've pumped it up, you seal it. And you only have to top up um, through a day. Uh, each piece is uh, designed so it can be carried by two people. Um, it's laid out on the floor. Um, and on the surface of all the pieces is printed the erection instructions in giant letters like zip this to that. Very simple. Um, colorful instructions. And then over the top are two skins. There's one that wraps this way. Uh, this is a, a, a long elevation. And there's one that wraps over the top so that you get a gap through the edge um, to emit ventilation. I should say that the group move around weekly. They finish their last show on a Saturday night, say at midnight. They take the um, structure down uh, Sunday. They put it up in their next venue Monday and they open Tuesday. And they do that every week. Um, so they're moving fast all the time. So it was very important that this was easy and was no sweat. Um, that's the, the current version. Um, the government then decided to cut subsidy to the arts. So we haven't been able to get the money together yet to do it. So. So consequently, because uh, Peter Rice, who did this, he's the guy that, uh, the engineer on Bobo, by the way, uh, has been working with me on this. And we keep redesigning it because every time they say, well, we haven't got the money, we then have a chance to rethinking it. And because consequently, our, our loss in fees is much more than the damn thing's going to cost in the end. Uh, we, I have to keep hiding the time I spend on it in the office. Otherwise, my partners complain. Then two final drawings that go back to insertions and putting objects together and to do with history and all those overlays. I, these things come out of the moment in time, I find, as conversations in architecture currently, which are to do with the place of history. I, in a way, uh, there's the career um, uh, philosophy of of, of going back to an earlier period and building it and starting again, which inserts history into our mind. Um, but uh, I then find myself commenting about the juxtaposition of history uh, to uh, modern technology. And I took the Cooper Hewitt here and tore it apart and put one piece on the outside to rot and put the rest in a showcase and split it um, as a comment on, on retention of history and history as a, but really to do with putting old things and new things together and traces of history as uh, images in the mirror. Thank you very much. If I could just give you another quote. I, I keep, if you could bear again, if you've heard it before, just an end note. This is um, a, a Mrs. Patrick Campbell. 
she wrote The Duchess of German Street. I don't know if you had that. It was a TV series we had in England, like The Pallisters and uh, The Love of Lydia and all those things. Anyway, and she says, it doesn't matter what you do in the bedroom as long as you don't do it in the street and frighten the horses. Thank you. <laughs> Architecture school. I went to architecture school evenings in London at the place called the Polytechnic, which is very professional, professionally oriented, um, teaches skill and uh, how to make buildings. Very boring. Um, you spent years drawing the orders. You know. You know what the orders are. Yeah. It very carefully and painting shadows on things. Um, and I went through that. And when I came out, I wondered what the hell I'd been doing because I didn't understand anything. And uh, until I met people like Warren Chalk, uh, who was one there, I can't remember, I, did, I discovered he didn't understand either. And we decided we both weren't idiots, that there must be something in another point of view. So we started rethinking for ourselves. Um, it was a very prescribed, program, you know, the, the sort of, I don't know if you get it here, where people tell you things, they don't never tell you why. They just say, this is like that, this is like that, and this like that, and this does that. And you store it all, and then you go out in the world and do it. Um, and you never ask why. So it was a reaction, I guess, what I do is a reaction to that. I was working in offices, of course, at the same time. So I've had a, a, a very, very, very non-academic I've had all my academic training through teaching over the last 15 years, 20 years, even. My friend, you're not going to ask the same question. <laughs> I really wouldn't, I'm sure I didn't criticize him, I wouldn't find it worth the bother. <laughs> um, I, I mean, uh, here, I think he's probably important because he's, uh, he's brought into play um, things that haven't been thought about or, uh, or haven't been discussed in the architectural world. Um, I find him very uninteresting. Um, a, a man who goes and writes a book called Learning from Las Vegas and doesn't put a coin in a machine is mad. And what about the future of megastructures? <laughs> it's a question <laughs> after your own heart. Uh, future of megastructures. They always exist in, in some form or the other, I think. Um, you have to get into that whole definition thing that Bannon goes on and on about. Huh? Um, I think uh, in the mind, uh, there are megastructures. Uh, um, Los Angeles is a megastructure. Um, I think simply because of that, it must make sense to think of things in those sorts of terms. It's really what planning should be about, megastructural thinking instead of sort of layered thinking. It, it should put all the parts together and, uh, and uh, think about it uh, as, as interactive elements. Um, now, whether it will ever manifest itself in those, uh, in the terms that uh, you and I were some years ago and you still pursue, I, I, think, I think possibly yes. But I think it will it'll be less, uh, certainly less uh, structured, uh, I don't mean structural structure, but structured, it'll be more open 
than we were ever drawing it in the 60s. I mean, it was easier to make the statement in those days by being very precise. I think the, the megastructure that's coming will be looser, a looser fit. Uh, it'll accept things. Uh, and it'll be there and we won't notice it, I suspect. Yeah, that, I mean, I'm, I, um, the handmade doesn't fascinate me. I come here and I go buying little tin robots. I collect robots. Uh, and I've been buying little tin robots. And they're, they're better than any of those crafted dolls for me. Um, handcrafted, I mean, it, you know, you, you can go to a shop and buy a pair of handcrafted shoes and you can go to a shop and buy a pair of plastic shoes and you have to be bloody clever to tell the difference. Um, I think the craft thing I is great for the craftsman um, and I'm all for the guy having a job, but I don't want to, don't want to know personally. Um, there's no magic in things being handmade. I mean, I, I tell you, I was in uh, Belfast recently. There's a friend of mine who's professor uh, at the Polytechnic, uh, Belfast, John Fraser, you may remember to. Um, and I couldn't understand why John Fraser, who's a very bright guy, was uh, sitting in Belfast, I mean, amongst all that bombing and shooting and searching and all that. Uh, and he invited me over, and I went with a lot of trepidation to this place, because it's dangerous. You see. And uh, there he is, sitting in a polytechnic, which or the polytechnics in, in, in Britain have a lot of money. Um, they're government aided and the government feed money in. And he's surrounded by computers, um, graphic computers as well. I mean, I, God knows what it cost. And playing with, with uh, these machines. And because I played with them as well, because I was visiting, he let me have a go. And I took a program that Cedric, uh, he'd written for Cedric Price, um, which was to do with his Florida project here, which is to do with the usual Cedric thing of moving parts and uh, putting things together and uh, uh, tuning and so on. And uh, you, you make very diagrammatic statements on this plotter, and you press a button, and then this magic machine draws a perspective. Now, there's nothing... That, that, I, for me, that's magic and marvelous. There's nothing magic about drawing, which is like the handcrafted thing, you see. I mean, I get pissed off with uh, this current vogue for crayoning things forever. Huh? Um, and, it, and it comes out of there being no work. Um, You've know, got nothing better to do, I'll crayon the drawing today. Uh, 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 and uh, this goes on. Uh, forever. I mean, it, it's uh, ridiculous. And we all get very, I do as well. I mean, I go there and I think, wow. Um, but it's a waste of time, isn't it? Really. Um, what it's about, you draw to communicate. And if you can get the machine to do it, and, and this machine, you see, you, you could actually keep shifting the viewpoint. Like I drew 20 perspectives in five minutes just by moving this thing around. Press a button, the thing does it. Uh, magic, and I'd love one of them, <laughs> <laughs> rather than three handcrafted draftsmen. And I mean that, uh, again, if you take that on into the handcrafted world. Uh, I'm not uh, nervous of technology. I hate that book, by the way, uh, the, the decorative book on high tech. What is the name of that machine? The machine? Yeah. It's a graphic computer, you mean? Yeah. Magic. <laughs> They've got them up at uh, UCLA and, uh, oh yeah, there's thousands of them in this. But Belfast? Wow. Then I guess going a step further in terms of... Oh, wait a minute, can I just add one thing? The, the key thing about this guy's program with the computer is that he was using it differently as well. He was using it not as an adding machine. You see, that that's what happens all the time. 
you, go to, you get students say, I'm going to do a computer study, huh? and you find what he's calculating is heat loss, or how many people you can sit in a space, a very boring thing. Uses it like an adding machine. But this guy Fraser is trying to get this machine to think, and that's why. What do you mean? <laughs> uh, do, do you mean, do I think it's a good idea, or...? Well, have you done some research, or...? No. No, I've drawn things. I've never done any... So I've visited the La Jolla um, and the Costo place, I, <coughs> and I spent hours when I was here in 68 in McDonnell Douglas and Cape Kennedy and Houston, but I don't know. Uh, I think it's smashing. Yes, I... Great idea for those that want to live on the moon and live in the water. The, I, you see, I think the, the thing about those sorts of programs isn't to do with that. It's just to do with uh, you have to think in a different way. Uh, if, you d if you tackle a program that's to do with living in the water, it's not like living on Wilshire. It's different. And anything that makes you think in a different sort of way must be useful because it actually then feeds back. It's useful. Well, how do you see the sort of creative design and quite creative design overall? At the moment, we have this situation where we go through five years and become sort of full architects. And we work in the practice as we're paid by a client so much percent on the job. Uh, you're working for Pentagram now, which is a slightly different structure for the total design. But it still seems to be stuck in sort of the design. It still isn't really making much impact on the environment. Um, basically, the design should, in some way, use our resources in the best possible way to create a very stimulating environment. Do you see any trends in sort of direct sort of interrelationship between industry and designer, or government and designer, or anything? No, no, I don't. I, I, we uh, part of Pentagram is, um, in fact, industrial design uh, arm. As uh, one of the partners is. Uh, Product designer, you call it industrial design, like Raymond Lowy, not like Raymond Lowy. But, um, uh, and w he finds it tough. I mean, industry, generally speaking, <coughs> uh, don't don't use designers. They use in-house people who were probably pay clerks uh, three years ago and are now designing. Um, the more enlightened do. Um, but even they very often use the designer as a packager, a guy that will tell him how to shape it and what colour to paint it and what's this year's okay twist to the thing. Eh? So uh, th that um, is not happening as far as I can see. Uh, it should happen, I agree. Um, <coughs> and government's probably worse. And government probably is, is uh, I, certainly in England, um, uh, we have a minister of the environment whose only interest in architecture is in the 17th century. Um, and he's responsible for all architecture and planning. So his main twist is, is preservation. Um, you know, where he ought to be out there uh, pushing. And, and I think, again, <coughs> the, our, our professional bodies don't operate in the right way either. They're never in there with government um, try or, or industry um, trying to convince what people in our profession might add. Um, they're, they're always talking amongst themselves about what the fee scale should be or uh, how you should teach a student to, to suck an egg um, <laughs> or, or who's going to be the next president. Uh, they always seem to be interminably tied up. Now. So I think if, it, I mean, I've thought that all, you know, for a long time, but it's very boring to get involved with your professional body, as you may well imagine. And so you don't. Um, and so all those boring people carry on doing the same thing. That's where the attack should be. And the schools.
gap, I mean, what they're going for in the bottom is like the house versus using the industrial system to create an object. It's reflective of that. I mean, your comment in terms of the in industry being connected to the, the building, that there is a chance in this particular area, and I guess this particular country at this moment, I would say, Yes, I mean, I, yes, it depends how much in industry are made to recognize that, uh, um, that that's what they're doing. Because really what industry are doing is making money. Uh, and they find that the means, I, I, they probably don't quite know what they're doing, I suspect. Uh, they're selling trailers, bigger trailers, or whatever. Um, I'm just curious, what do you as a professional think of this institution for training architects? This one? Yeah. Uh, well, I don't know. I've never taught here. I visited, and I know Ray and a, a few of your other teachers. Um, I teach at the AA in London, and the nearest thing to the AA here is here. And I think Lond uh, the AA in London is probably the best school of architecture in the world. Well, I don't think you, they, the Japanese uh, are amazing, aren't they? They, I have two or three friends. Isasaki is one, and Isasaki comes to London, and uh, here he is. I don't know how many, five thousand miles away, six thousand miles away, and he arrives in London, and he knows exactly what's going on. He, he, he even knows the top ten records and where the best discotheque is. I mean, I don't know. Right? And he, he arrives and says, I want to go to so-and-so. And somehow the Japanese have, uh, the better ones, uh, have uh, an ability to absorb this sort of information. When they learn, they learn. Um, and we could learn something from that. Eh? But uh, the interesting thing, I think, uh, in, in my own work, or the archigram work, I don't think it, it's actually ever, they, nobody's ever understood, you see. What's easy, and like Boberg, it's easy to build that uh, image, isn't it? But you see, the thing we were talking about was a non-static structuring, uh, something that was in change. And, and all these people put it together in a very rigid way. So it's got nothing to do, it was like fashion. You see, it, it was what goes on here. I mean, and I can see it happening in this city. You get people, um, that unfortunately, don't talk enough about what they're doing. Um, like Moore and Geary here, um, who are doing a very particular sort of thing, and very often very personal. Uh, um, and in Moore's case, with a, a great depth of history. But the easiest thing in the world is to copy it, you see. And you copy it mindlessly. Uh, and it's not the same. And that, that's the unfortunate thing. Um, it, it's like the condemnation of the modern movement. Huh? You know, I mean, it's very popular to say all that 20s stuff is a load of old rubbish. Um, in fact, what's the rubbish is the stuff that followed by people not understanding, not thinking, treating it as style, and not even understanding that they were doing that. There's a strange double takes that go on. I think they jump about, you see. Um, uh, if you, again, if you look at um, the general, I mean, there are very good people there. But if you generally look at the work, it, it, it's, uh, it's jumping. And the, 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 we're in a moment where nobody knows what's going on. Uh, and so everybody's jumping like bloody mad. If only we'd all stand still a bit, it, it, we could see what was happening. Um, and, s and stop and think about it. mentioning now 
change exists, which seems to go up and down with maybe the rate of change, the acceleration, it seems to be very fast. I'm a new student at this school. I give a lot of thought to number one, being a student first, <coughs> and then school second. And of course, the idea of experience and whatnot. Now again, with the rate of change, I'm sure there's been different than when you were in school and you wanted to get out and get experience, but do you have any thoughts towards the uh, student in school and the student in the tangible, out there getting tangible experience with one architect or another and one? Well, I think you have to do both those things. Uh, you see, the school, what school does and what you're not getting in an office is a lot of time for talking. Uh -huh. And, uh, you know, someone that says, what I want is that. Um, and you sit and do it, and then he gives you another that to do. Um, and, and what's needed, and, and the best officers, of course, have conversation. There's a discussion about why, why something's happening, what it's about, why the move is made, why the compromise happens. Um, but in school, you're in a, in a marvelous situation where anything's possible, anything. And the, the whole history of architecture is laid out for you to draw some inspiration from, not to copy, and I'm talking about recent history as well, um, to try and understand and learn and build up your own attitude to what architecture might be. But you, what you get from the office, if you choose your office carefully, is the conversation in that real world as well. So you understand why things don't happen like they might happen. Um, and the, the compromises and the arguments that get, you get into. And I think you have to have these two things. And ideally, you work when you can as well, summers. And, and you choose. You have to choose you know, very carefully. And that's the, that's the difficult thing. Well, I, I think you see the the, you, the media is there, isn't it? I mean, the, the, you you can write things and you can make things and you can publish things and you make noise, um, and th that's how it's done in the end by concerted effort. Uh, um, I mean, it, it's a pity. It always seems a pity to me that um, that the, in architecture there's not enough in schools uh, uh, of attention paid to this possibility of, of the, the sort of uh, intensive study by groups of people, directed study. It means you as a student very often have to uh, give up your ego for three or four weeks or three or four months or whatever to work with someone uh, to, to make a, a concentrated attack on an idea. Um, but you, you have that, you see. That, it's all there. You know, I mean, I, God knows how many people are in this room. If you all got together, I mean, God forbid, but uh, uh, the arguments that would occur. You know, but, uh, you know, if, you, if, if you're stronger as a group, always. The individuals, uh, it's much tougher. But you, as a group, you can cover a lot of ground and make uh, a lot of noise in the system. The government, listen. How do you mean? Is that a part of the curriculum? It's a uh, school of architecture, huh? Yes, but are they teaching, uh, what you're saying is they need communication. Are you teaching? Oh, teaching architect? communication, yes. Communication. Yes, it's a, it's, I don't know how much of the budget goes into just that, yes. <coughs> Maybe the hologram that you're involved in now is an alternative thing. Maybe it's not. Do you have any ideas 
No, it doesn't. Well, I. The, the, usually, the problem is just financing your time. Uh, and most architects sit or try and find a client that will finance that. Uh, so it's a real project. But the, uh, that's what I was getting at. In school, you have that. You have all the resources of the student body huh, and the faculty. Um, you don't need uh, commercial money necessarily. There are foundation monies available, um, uh, um, which people are sitting there waiting to give out um, if you tackle that in the right sort of way. That's, that, that sort of pure uh, research is probably where new ideas will emerge rather than through directly through commercial interests. You've got to bring them together in the end. You briefly mentioned career earlier. Could you comment on the rationalism and that kind of viewpoint? Elaborate more. Oh, you know what they're about? A little, yes. Um, I, I find it difficult, like uh, the Venturi question. I don't find it interesting, you see. Um, uh, they make uninhabited places. They're, they're, to me, the, 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 the statements that are made, the, the, the uh, <coughs> studies that they do, both the careers, um, are to do with architectural space and to do with a link to history. Um, they seem to have nothing to do with what that's about, what it's for. Um, and it's like making Main Street at Disneyland in a different way to me. Um, you, you rarely, rarely see a plan. You'll see innumerable aerial perspectives with pre-1914 aeroplanes and balloons to catch your eye. Um, I think there's a, there's a serious study there. I think the younger career, Rob career, I think he's the younger one. Um, has, do you know his recent book? I forget what it's called, but he, he huh? Right. There's a very nice, I mean, the best thing about the book is the um, Colin Rowe introduction, which is marvelous. It's worth buying just for that. Um, but he obsessively is looking at urban spaces. Uh, and he draws them. You know, he, he'll draw, draw sort of corners with gaps through and high buildings. But, but it's madness because he, he depicts it in one way. You, you, you could plug a computer into that uh, and the, the computer would spend its life discovering all the possibilities. Um, and they're, they're to do really with the little ink, ink drawings, pages and pages of these little ink things that are from Rome or, or something. But uh, I find probably useful, but for me, uninteresting. In terms of reducing change, the metabolism and the design of the Funny enough, we had very little. Uh, the metabolists were d about quite different things. You realize that? Uh, yeah. There was some connection. Isosaki would also claim not to be a metabolist. He worked for Tangi, but you, if you, you talk to him, he, he's been lumped with uh, the metabolists. He'll claim not to be. Well, anyway, but that... Right.
They, they, they were happening, at the, you, what you find, you see, is those things happen at the same time. There were other people. There was a guy called Schultz Felitz in, in uh, Europe and Jona Friedman uh, and so on that were working in very similar uh, connected type areas. Um, it, you find that those things are sort of in the air somehow and go on. There was no conversation with the metabolists until later. Um, we didn't actually know them, only through magazines. And likewise, uh, I mean, for instance, uh, the... That's what happens, yes, sure. Um, and that gets you know, th th this is my, really what I'm saying with this library. I mean, you can style it, but unless it's, it's got a program that allows it to, uh, to operate in the way it should operate, um, it's an abstraction then. I mean, government does, big business does have a tendency to to be retrogressive. In the office, this is from, I don't know, 9.30 to 7 every day. Um, it's difficult to tell you how much of that time is one thing or the other. But the, um, a lot of that time is spent in trying to uh, bring into fruition ideas you have, to try and put it into that world. I spend all the rest of my time doing those things. I go home and I eat and then I work every day and every weekend. And Sunday is my busiest day. Um, I work on these things um, all day Sunday uh, and into the night, and like you all do. Um, and, and what I think this, I, I, someone asked me where I was trained. You see, I went to evening school. So from, uh, as a youngster, I was used to work uh, and then going home and thinking. Um, uh, and I've, uh, I've continued. I mean, I, I get very uh, upset when I'm not doing things outside of, even when we had the archigram office, um, which you would have thought was ideal, uh, we would all go home and be doing these other things and then they'd all come back into the... You, you have to put a, it's, uh, you're a lot of time into... Uh, you can't cover enough ground, you see. There's no time, is there? You think of all those things you've never seen and, and all those things you... I mean, I've got a file, filing cabinet, full of files of things I've not done. <laughs> you know, that little thing and a bit of writing and a book you start and a... Uh, scheme you half did and think, well, I'll pick that out in collection. Um, you, I, would, I would really like to do that all the time. That, the library I showed, was a competition. Um, and I did that on my own um, in three weeks of evenings um, with some help from my son uh, uh, last day or two. Um, and I like to do that because there are times I find I don't want any interference. 
um, I want to do the thing I want to do. Um, there are competitions then we do in the office because it interests two or three people um, and then the office will finance that. Huh? We did a Vienna a competition in Vienna a couple of years ago, um, four of us, and the office paid for us to go to Vienna and we spent a week there. And it was very nice and we, we didn't win anything. doesn't mean they can't be the same thing. Huh? Um, this city has got nothing to do with density, in a sense. I mean, it's strictly not dense, is it, this city? Oh, it is. It, well, what's a city? A city is not to do with density. It's to do with uh, an amazing collection of people. Uh, I mean, a village uh, exists in a very quiet way, very little activity. It's a continuum. A city is to do with an explosion of thinking and ideas, and all those people being in the same place. Now, this place, because of the way it operates, I mean, the, the motor car and so on, uh, it doesn't need to be the compact city, or hasn't needed to be. It may well need to be in, in the, these days of oil problems and so on. But if you take London, for instance, if I go from my home to the AA, uh, it's 10 miles away, huh? hardly any distance. It'll take me an hour to get there. Um, here, an hour, how far would you go in an hour? 50 miles? So uh, the connectivity is exactly the same. The ease of my communication with other people uh, like-minded people and so on, in the, which is what a city is about, is no different to here. And the availability of, uh, of things in a, I, I is to do with the city, isn't it? Where it's, you can do things, you can go and get things, you can have things made easily. The yellow pages tell you that. But it's, it's still the notion of a lot of things within a time. Period. Yeah, time. Okay. Yeah, but time, you see. You're misunderstanding. I mean, that my answer was that it would have individuality. Um, the, the, I mean, the whole essence of the history of megastructure is to make things tighter. Yeah? Um, a megastructure isn't necessarily a machine. Um, a megastructure or a concept of, of the street in a megastructure can have if you examine what the street means, can have all that fed into it. But uh, you'd find it difficult in this city to talk about streets, though, huh? In this city? Yeah, I, I have trouble thinking about the city. Oh, it's, a, it's a, certainly a city. I mean, I don't know. If I come here, and, or if any of my friends are coming here, um, and they have two weeks to see America. Um, they only need to visit New York and Los Angeles uh, and, and, and ideally drive the rest. Um, and you've got the two extremes there, haven't you? You've got New York, uh, which is tight, hyperactive, uh, the big city, the, the, the um, big city that we always think of when you say city. And you've got Los Angeles, which is also hyperactive, and is even bigger, uh, and, and the communications work in a different way. But those two places tell you, I mean, for instance, again, if you're like me from London, Los Angeles is like London. Uh, it's a, a collection of small villages. It's just spread more. Um, New York has, has similar 
context. I mean, I'd rather be in London, New York, or Los Angeles than Paris, for instance. I find Paris very boring. I don't know, I just find it very boring. Um, it's something to do with the sameness of it. I mean, I, I think the worst thing that happened to Paris, and uh, this is where I start to disagree with the Koreas, you see, is Hausermann. Okay.